Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. Uh, we are back with new shows for 2013. And uh, again, you can always find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find all the old shows there, subscribe, look up at our blogs, and find all of our Twitters and stuff like that. I also have with me Jeff Swires of Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Hey, Brock. Welcome to 2013, even though it's, you know, really December 2012. But don't tell anybody that. It's... Yes, we were recording this ahead of time, and it will be released. It'll be the first show released in the new year, but we are recording it at the end of the previous year. Uh, scheduling. <laughs> so, what okay. we got, Brock? Okay, so today we have uh, DMTCP, and we have two people from Northeastern University here that are developers of it. We have Gene Cooperman and uh, Kapul Aaron. Um, Let's once again, I'm sure I killed that name. Yeah, let's give the standard disclaimer that we're ugly Americans and we're terrible at pronouncing uh, other nationality names. So when, uh, why don't we have you guys introduce yourselves and give the correct pronunciation of your names? So, uh, hi, I'm uh, Gene Cooperman. Uh, really pleased to uh, be here. And uh, so just, uh, I guess, a little bit about my bio. Way back a long time ago, my degree was in applied math. Uh, I, uh, at some point, got heavily involved in uh, parallel computing, uh, computational algebra, and so on. And one thing led to another, uh, and at some point I started wor worrying, if this program keeps on running for a long time, and then the computer crashes in the middle, what are we going to do? And so then uh, at some point I became heavily invested in Checkpoint Restart, maybe around 2004, 2005. Hi, um, I'm Kapil Adri, and um, I'm actually a fifth-year PhD student with uh, Professor Cooperman, and uh, uh, before coming here, I was uh, I finished my degree uh, in like my bachelor's in computer science from India, and uh, glad to be here. Okay, so give us a little bit of background. Uh, DMTCP. It was only recently brought to my attention. W what is it? So um, it stands for distributed multi-threaded checkpointing. Um, so uh, this is what happens when you uh, ask the students to come up with a name for a project. Uh, but the good news is that you can Google on it, and you will always get our project. You'll never get something else. Um, so the idea is, is that you have a program running, and you want to save its state into a checkpoint image, restart it later, restart multiple copies, whatever you want to do. And um, it should be totally transparent. You shouldn't have to modify the binary you shouldn't have to modify the operating system. It should just work. That's the basis of what we're doing. Now, what is the point of this? Why, why is checkpoint a good, good thing? So you said a second ago that, you know, I've got this long-running program and the computer dies. What happens? But is that a, a practical problem? Does this happen in real life? And, you know, what does having something like DMTCP um, mean to the application developer and the end user? So... <clears throat> yeah, it, um, it, it's a really important problem. So in high-performance computing, batch queues, and so on, <clears throat> people have known about this uh, forever. Uh, suppose you're given a certain slot of time, up to 24 hours, and your program is going to take 36 hours. What do you do? Uh, this is one of the places where people would often come to us. Um, but then um, there are a lot of just ordinary people working on the desktop who uh, want to run a program for a long time, maybe on their laptop, and they don't really want to keep their laptop in one place for the next 72 hours. Um, so it just adds a lot of flexibility. And then later in the program, we, we hope to talk about some more unusual applications of Checkpoint Restart, which go far beyond the original high-performance computing. So a lot of high-performance computing applications, large parallel applications, already have checkpointing built into the application itself. Why make something like this? So this is a great point. Um, so people distinguish between application-level checkpointing and system-level or transparent uh, checkpointing. Uh, at the application level, the programmer has to work harder to make it happen. If you're running on some kind of supercomputer, uh, then the machine is expensive and you just spend the human resources to do it. Uh, and so that's not really the area in which we play. But for uh, ordinary researchers, which may have uh, a smaller research group, 
maybe they're scientists and they don't want to spend their time writing uh, unusual code in order to save only their data structures and nothing else. If they get it wrong, they just have to start over. Um, using DMTCP, it's a no-brainer. No you just start under DMTCP and you ignore it. And whenever you want, you can set a checkpoint. You can do it on, on a timer at regular intervals. You can have your program ask for a checkpoint when it wants it. Uh, and, and then it just works behind the scenes, uh, which is the way the best software should work. So compared to the application level checkpoint, though, what's some of the... So that was the benefits. What's some of the downsides to using this transparent checkpointing? Um, so the downsides in initially is we've taken a philosophy that we don't modify the kernel, the binary, or anything. Therefore, when it comes time to checkpoint, we have to work harder to interrogate, uh, for example, the kernel about any missing state. Uh, we do support distributed computations. We have to work harder to figure out what data is in the network. Um, so especially in the early years of DMTCP, our coverage was not as good as we would like. Um, we're, we've been working to improve that coverage now, uh, adding a number of heuristics and more recently plugins so that the end user can easily add coverage to checkpoint aspects that we don't uh, directly handle. So that sounds kind of like magic, right? You said you don't change the application, you don't change the kernel. Um, how does this work then? Yeah, it's, it's a good point. Um, so the, the simplest example is suppose you have an open file at the time of checkpoint. Uh, what we'll do is, uh, this, so I should say this works primarily under Linux right now, although we, there seems to be a recent port to Android that we're also excited about. Um, and because we can checkpoint a virtual machine, we can checkpoint Windows inside the virtual machine. In any case, um, to take an example, suppose you have an open file at the time of checkpoint. Then uh, in Linux, you go to the proc file system, find what your open files are. Using LSeq, you can determine what is the current offset. You save that. Uh, and then when you restart, we restore all of memory, so the program doesn't even know that it was checkpointed. It just assumes it's continuing. It looks up the offset and sets the offset back to what it should be, opens the file descriptor to the original descriptor uh, number, and so on. Now, you said earlier, too, that it can fire via a timer. Is that via a signal, or, or uh, what, what mechanism is that? Um, the simplest way to do it is uh, to let DMTCP handle, uh, use its own internal timer. So the D stands for distributed. Uh, when you have distributed processes, you want to have a central coordinator that talks to everybody. Uh, so the end user talks to the coordinator, and all of his applications register themselves with the coordinator. A late process on a new computer can just join the, the computation by calling up the coordinator. And then the coordinator has a timer. When the timer goes off, it will send a message to each of the individual processes saying it's time to checkpoint. Meanwhile, we've added a, at the same time, we have added a hijack library in each user process, and that hijack library has created a checkpoint thread, which is our code and is listening to the coordinator to find out when it's time to checkpoint. I see. So you're running off in, a, in an extra thread over there and then can just wake up whenever you choose to, whether it's by an event or a timer or, or whatever you want. How do you uh, stop the main thread, well, actually all the other threads, and, and restart that? That seems like you have to get into a little bit of plumbing there. Um, we, we do a little, uh, but it, uh, it seems to work well. So the sequence of events is this. Uh, at the time, typically the user will just start up their own application. That application might transparently create a coordinator if there is not already one at the default location. Uh, after that, uh, the application runs 